Ladies and gentlemen, ever since chess was invented, there have been many, many games played. Some of them have been good, some of them have been terrible, but some of them have had simply unbelievable moves played. And so in this video, I have compiled a list of what I think are 10 of the greatest chess moves ever, ever played. They are usually played at the highest of levels like Grandmaster, even one computer game. They are breathtaking, stunning, momentum changing, game ceiling, and so on and so forth. Timestamps are in the video player for each of the games. The final three are basically the Hall of Fame, and if my voice sounds a little bit raspy, uh, I'm sick. I actually haven't been sick in the nearly one and a half years of making consistent content on this channel, uh, but I'm powering through for this video because if I don't make a video today, that'll be two days in a row that I don't make content, which has literally never happened. So uh, if my voice sounds you know, a bit off, then uh, don't worry about it. Here we go. First game on our list is from Poland, Poznan, 1931. And as I said in the intro, there might be some repeats. You might have seen this already, but if you haven't, our protagonists are Tilkowski, who is basically the Polish McLovin, only he's got one name on his documents, very confusing for the authorities, and Antony Wojciechowski. And in this position, Black plays the move Rook to D2. Now that is not the, that is not the move, but I gotta set it up. The threat is obviously to take the pawn on B2, potentially come back, remove the knight from guarding this pawn, and promote. So white naturally defends the pawn, but white doesn't defend the pawn at all because black plays the absolutely ludicrous move, rook takes b2. Now you're saying, what the hell is that? The guy just hangs his rook, knight takes b2. What, what is this all about? Well, here's the thing, c3. And now you would think that the pawn needs two squares to either take and promote or push and promote, and white just obviously has enough time to prevent this. But it's actually not so clear because rook takes b6 is played in the game. Now, if white had played the move knight to d3, then after the simple check, rook b6, in this position, c takes d3. Two pawns on the sixth or third rank that stand side by side cannot be stopped by a rook. If you just leave them against the rook, you can leave them against other people as well, but not against the rook. But in this position, um, white chose to take on b6 to uh, have c takes b2, rook takes, and c2 here. And white must have thought, well, I'm, I'm all good. But then came the final punch c4. You see, white was already wobbly on the two feet, getting rocked with a couple of punches, but was gonna recover. But then came c4. But even that wasn't the end of the story, because here, white played the move rook to b4. And now if you push, there is this, and if this, then this. So, what, so now here comes a5. Knight takes c4, because if rook takes c4, cb, and you cannot prevent me, right? Uh-oh, so knight takes c4, and now rather than taking the rook and stopping your dreams of making a queen, you continue to push. The knight and the rook can now not prevent you from making a queen, so white needs to scramble to get as much as possible for that queen. And that actually doesn't look so bad. Rook, knight, pawn, that's nine points for a queen. However, there's this move. And now if the rook stands around defending the knight, then there would be the absolutely brutal geometric motif check, king g1, queen d1, and a fork of your king and rook. So that move, rook takes b2, giving up a rook, a full rook in an endgame, is absolutely ludicrous. But this one begins our, our video because the absolute craziness of the combination being 8 to 10 moves long in an endgame like that is just simply unbelievable. Let's go to the second one. Our second game is a battle in Banyu in France, and our players here are Emil Joseph Diemer, who was a Nazi, basically, and Frau Tromsdorf, who as far as I know was not a Nazi, so you know whose side I'm on. Um, and, uh, you know, this game was probably the most insane game I've ever seen in my life, but it also featured the move, which I believe I named a video called the best move I've ever seen, if I'm not mistaken. Um, maybe this game was, there was a period of time I was making a lot of videos with these kind of like insane games. So here white played a crazy move, but it doesn't actually qualify for the video. Queen g4. The move queen g4 is incredible because it actually is a full attack on this queen. Um, and if you take, then white would play knight to f6 check, pick up this, and both pawns would simply promote as the knight hangs and the rook also hangs. And don't ask how this bishop got here, okay? This <laughs> is it's a closeted bishop. Oh boy. All right. Uh, that's, that's, that, that, that's quite a, that's quite a joke. So, um, let's back up for a moment, yeah? So, uh, in this position, black plays the move, black plays a move which is just simply incredible. Um, you could try to guess it. You, you can probably take whatever drug necessary to try to find this move. You probably will not find it. Um, it's this. I mean, 
That move is simply stunning. So first things first, what the hell happens if you just get your queen taken? Well, then this. And it doesn't matter how much artillery white has, including that empty square which I clicked, white just can't stop you from making a queen. And it's even, it's even worse than that, because white can bring all the pieces to attack you. you that's it, they all kind of trip over themselves. If you could capture your own pieces, that would be great, but even that wouldn't fully work. Um, and if you try to like make a run for it, then this little cage, rookie 2, king c1, and promotion, and the game is over because it's checkmate, and checkmate ends the game. If you didn't know that, well, I mean, that, the rest of the video is going to be a bit over your head. Um, now, if you take the pawn either way, then you also lose. Uh, C takes B3 is another option, uh, then knight to B4 comes, with the threat of knight takes A2, king takes D2, rook E2 mate, with also this double check stuff going on. Uh, the queen hangs in all these variations. The, the game actually proceeded with um, A takes B3, check here, and then um, this move, which just, I mean, black is just intent on sacrificing every piece that they have. If queen takes, uh, then you have here, king a2, and various mates, but this is the easiest, bishop c4. Uh, but the cleaner move here would have been knight d2 back. Uh, and then if king c1, then you should play knight b4. So you actually go for the same checkmate. But believe it or not, after the move b3, knight takes b3 and rook d3, Queen g1, uh, in, in this position, it's like force made in some moves. Uh, after knight d2, queen went back to d8 to try to go to a5. Uh, but then, I think a few moves later, white, uh, black made a terrible mistake. Like, black is completely winning here, and then for some reason took this. What black should have done is played here, here, here. And just forgot that if they throw in a capture of a rook and then this, then king d2. And then white was completely winning, and then the players ended the game in a draw. So, utter disaster in Banyu, but uh, the move B3 by itself absolutely qualifies for this video. This one is not from a tournament called the USSR Titans. It's from USSR Championship, the championship of the Soviet Union in 1949, and the players are Flor and Geller. Um, and uh, the USSR Championship back in the 1940s, 50s, and 60s was essentially the championship of the world. I mean, all the best players in the world, except for a few, were from the Soviet Union. Uh, and Geller was one of the best technical players of all time, uh, of that time and of all time, and Flor is also a very strong player. Uh, this endgame is better for Black, and Geller is trying to push it. Why is it better for Black? Black has the more active rook. Uh, this rook is quite literally in jail. I don't even... Well, I do know how that happened because the entire game is in front of me, but we don't need to worry about that. But how does black actually win? Well, let's let, let's trust Geller. Geller uses his two-on-one advantage to create a pass pawn, which would ultimately keep the king distracted. But um, now white is trying to break out. Now, if you take on f4, it's never too late to just blunder a full rook. So please don't do that. Um, but here's the problem. Uh, if you play rook takes e4, then comes king d3. And you say, well, that's not a problem at all. I just play rook b4. No, that is very much a problem because, as I said, it's never too late to blunder a rook. We've now hung two rooks, one for each color. Because we're very, <laughs> we're very communist. Shout out to the Soviet Union. A lot of jokes in this video. A lot of, a lot of, a lot of this uh, borderline humor. So this move is possible, and now both sides hang a rook. Um, you could also go down all the way down here, but then check, and then here, and then you don't win the game. You lose your only advantage. So, um, but, you know, you don't really have a choice. Here's the problem. You don't really have a choice, because you actually have to take on, A4, on E4. You can play this move, um, but then uh, I think white takes, and if king E5, there is rook G5. If, well, king E6 is very tricky. King D4, A2, but then this, and it's still unclear, but... This video is called the 10 best chess moves ever played. So rook e4, king d3. I left something to be discovered. In this position, Gellior played one of the most gangster moves I've ever seen. Simply, he played the move, king to g7. Are you kidding me? King to g7 is so gross. So if you take on e4, now this move is just not a check. So basically he sidestepped this being a check. Right? So it's not a check anymore, so that's not a problem. Um, and then if king e4, he promotes. If the move rook g5 were to be played, a3, king c2, rook a4, you have to prevent the pawn from promoting, and then we take, take, and we take, and you're going to lose this endgame. And the game actually ended with Floor trying to break out his rook, Geller giving up the rook, and this is winning, but you have to be very precise here. 
He's precise by making sure white has no chance for a fortress, because the king is way too out and advanced. And he, slowly but surely, uh, moved the king very, very far away, and ultimately ended the game over here, as the pawns will either be hunted down, or the king will be checkmated. So, king g7. God damn. For this one, we're actually going uh, to the United States Championship, uh, some 14 years later. Uh, 14, 15 years later. This is played in New York, uh, and uh, Bobby Fischer is our protagonist versus Pal Benko. Now, this game was a relatively short one, um, and it was a peer to defense by Pal Benko. Uh, the opening is not of utmost importance, but uh, the game gets exciting very quickly because Black plays the move e5, and Bobby Fischer takes once. This is a very common idea against the peer to defense. Anytime you have three and they have two like this, you have played the Austrian attack with your F-pawn. That's what this is on move four, the Austrian attack. So uh, a very common motif is to take with the D-pawn and move the F-pawn forward because now the center is more locked, so it's difficult for the opponent to open up the lines. Black still has some ways to create counterplay like knight to d4, uh, but chooses to take on f5, which is very bold, and then play knight d4. The queen pressures everything, and also the benefit of uh, closing the center with this trade is that this bishop kind of sucks. And you can, you know, do all this good stuff, rook here, reroute the knight. This bishop is the only problem, but you can just play bishop c4. Anyway, let's, let, let's let Bobby do the work. So queen f2, uh, short castle to line up more attack. Rotate the queen. Now black moves the king out of the way. Queen g4, because we want to go to h5 and just kind of chill there for a little bit, right? c6, and now queen e8. So queen e8 is a nice move. The idea of queen e8 is that if, if white goes for something like takes, takes e5, right? That looks very strong. Then black plays this nice move, f5. And here, if you follow the uh, anarchy chess rule of life and you play en passant then you're gonna lose your queen so you, you really gotta you really gotta look in the mirror here and, and, and see whose side you're on um so queen e8 actually is a move that makes a lot of sense except it loses and it loses and it gets featured in this video but what the hell am i talking about how does that move lose i mean it, it where's the knockout punch i mean okay you can play like bishop h6 which looks very natural but take take i mean the queen can't do damage by herself you know black has just simply too much defense so here Bobby played the absolutely stunning uh, Galvanina Clementine Soda. Bishop takes d4. E takes d4. You want to play f5, right? But what if I play this move? Rook to f6. That's a dirty move. That looks like a mouse slip. I mean, it just straight up looks like, I don't know, like you, I mean, rook f6. It looks like a, a game sent to me by two 500s, you know? And one of them was like, oh, I saw horse was not protected. I wanted to attack horse. Then I lost the horse. I mean, then I lost my rook. Except this move blocks f5. So if rook f6, bishop f6, e5, you have no way to prevent checkmate. It's absolutely incredible. There's just no way to prevent it. So naturally, rook f6, uh, you cannot take, right? So king g8. But now all of this all the same. And here Bobby has a variety of ways to win. Uh, but he chooses uh, the most aesthetic, not the most brutal. Just plays knight to e2. Just knight e2. Because, again, if bishop takes f6, you still cannot prevent mate. And uh, you really have no moves. Uh, if, the, the idea is just to play like knight g3, queen g4, knight to h5, or knight g3, knight f5. And so Palbanko said, you know what, f this. I already blundered rook f6. I don't want to play this bastard anymore. I'm resigning. Let's go to game 5 in the Gotham video. This game is from the original 2017 match between AlphaZero and Stockfish. As we now know, in 2021, Stockfish and NUE, uh, and it's pronounced like an NU or NU or whatever, uh, and uh, Leela are some of the best engines in the world. But uh, back then, AlphaZero showed up on the scene and absolutely clobbered Stockfish. And if you haven't seen that video of mine, absolutely do go see it. Uh, this is one of their earlier sample games. And Alpha Zero plays the move e5. But as you know, that is not the move that is in question. e5 is a very natural move. Um, and this is from a Queen's Indian defense where oftentimes white has a lead in development and is usually down one pawn. But if you count the pawns right now, white is actually down two. White is down two pawns. But what does white have? Way more activity and black's coordination doesn't make any sense. Uh, the knight on b8 is never going to move. How the hell do you get any of this out? Now, if white just waits around with basically nonsense moves, 
uh, then black is going to play like d5, knight c5, knight d7, and just have two pawns up. So white needs to be energetic. White plays knight c3. Uh, Stockfish plays knight b7 looking to play d5. We have this. And now white naturally has to play the move h4 because you have more developed pieces facing the side of the board. So naturally you need to go create an attack h5. And as much as Stockfish really should consider playing this move because I'm probably better than Stockfish, Stockfish goes here, which is kind of depressing because after this, uh, knight f6 check is threatened. So black goes here. And um, <clears throat> king h8 sets up the move f5. So it also prevents knight f6 because a move ago you were threatening to win the queen. So king h8 threatens f5. Now, if you know that f5 is a threat, what do you say to yourself? You're like, I got to move the queen or the knight. It's pretty, pretty obvious, right? Um, the engine also gives b4 because if f5, then there's this, this pin, right? So at least you can delay a little bit and maybe play bishop b2. But here, Alpha Zero played. I could probably give you like 10 guesses and you wouldn't guess it. Ah, 10 is a lot, but I feel like th this move is, is so brutish. Uh, the move is Bishop G5, which is just simply insane. Uh, the point is that if you take. I put your queen in jail, because if you play queen h6, you lose to boom, and now boom, and if king h7, you lose to boom. So you're just getting mated, right? You just have no escape, even though you're up six points of material. And if you play f5, well, then I pin you, then this is the idea. The idea is to make sure your rook doesn't have a comfortable space to live. And so after this, black decides to create some counterplay, and even wins a ton of material. Like, but this is what black is left with. A six-point material advantage where none of the pieces can get out. You're up six points, but eight of your points on the back rank there can't even move. The knight can't move, which therefore means the rook can't move. And uh, Alpha Zero went on to win. Although Alpha Zero went on to win in 120 moves because engines are absurd defenders and will defend the slightly worse position for 80 more moves instead of just calling it a day. Bishop to g5. What the hell, man? All right, let's go to the next one. Our sixth game features two of the greatest players ever. Um, one of them is widely regarded as the greatest player ever, and one of them is unquestionably top five, top 10, and those players are Kasparov and Kramnik, respectfully. Uh, respectively? Respectfully. Respectively. Yeah. No, respectfully is like when you say, oh, he's bussing respectfully. Okay, so Rook D6. This is a game in Novgorod. Uh, no Novgorod, I don't know. Uh, in Russia, 1994, Gary has just played the move rook d6. That attacks a queen. Uh, Kramnik uh, cannot actually move his queen, because if Kramnik plays this move, uh, Kasparov crashes through. This is actually a fake attack. The king is actually completely safe on c2, d2, getting out of the checks. So Kramnik plays knight d5. If rook b6, knight f4, a lot of stuff is hanging. This is hanging. That's under attack. This is hanging. Like, all the pieces simplify. So... Kasparov, uh, in this position, understanding his queen's under attack, there's a queen over here, this is under attack, this can be taken, that can be taken in the future, uncorks the absolutely wild move, h5. Now that move on its own doesn't actually shock anybody, because at least you're like, knight takes f4, alright, he's gonna take a queen. So obviously Kasparov isn't afraid of anything. Except, that wasn't his idea at all. After knight takes f4, Gary played pawn takes rook. What? He just left the queen on the table? So now he's got a hanging rook, a hanging rook, and a hanging knight. The only thing in, in Kasparov's position that's safe is the bishop, right? I mean, the bishop is just vibing. The bishop just the, is not under any sort of pressure. Uh, everything in the position can be taken. Here's the problem. It's Gary's move. So before Kramnik can gobble everything, it's not a buffet, right? So Gary gets to make a move himself. And he plays, uh, well, I'm, I'm sorry. Uh, it's not Gary's move right now. When Kramnik decides to take one of these pieces, then it's Gary's move. What I, that's what I meant to say. That's why I made the buffet reference, because Kramnik can't take everything. It's not all you can eat. Queen takes d6. Uh, if he had played knight takes this rook, then we would have had g takes f7. This is hanging, and that hangs. And uh, this hangs. So that's a problem. 
Uh, if you took the knight, well, that's very nice. But then I take with check, and then I take the queen. So two of my rooks survive. Your bishop dies. Very bad position. So Kramnik took the rook that's actually the problem, which is the one that's attacking his queen. But then there's check here, check here, and Mr. Kasparov gets a new queen. Right? And now bishop f5 is looming, queen f7 is looming, everything is looming. And what ends up happening is this. Check, check, he picks up one more pawn for his troubles before he picks up the knight, which is very common, by the way. You would think that naturally you go here, but there's many motifs where the queen can give just a few more checks and results in uh, the pickup of a pawn. And in this position, Kramnik resigned because he's losing his queen, although he was probably low on time, and this is just a losing endgame regardless because of the pass pawn and how weak this e4 pawn is. But h5. Yeah, you gotta be really damn good to just leave the entire board of pieces under attack and calculate all that straight through. Because you don't just calculate what happens in the game, you also have to calculate all the auxiliary stuff, right? All right, let's go to our next one. You cannot make a list of the best chess moves ever played and not add the magician of Riga, Mikhail Tal. And that is because this dude was simply, uh, I mean, like, he, he made chess more fascinating in the time that he was on earth and 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 uh you can include so many of his examples but this one is a lot of fun he's playing anatolia lutikov which just sounds like a guy who's like a chess master um and the opening uh wasn't anything super impressive it was actually the elephant gambit which maybe in 1964 was super scary um and uh you know queenie two and we don't we don't need to spend a humongous amount of time here because it's just simply chaos there's like night hanging you know this is hanging but Tal received a winning position relatively quickly um and uh bishop g5 cd5 long castle knight c6 but you know Tal in his usual style can just win a game of chess like by taking back on f3 and then potentially trading queens and just being like a comfortable pawn up with a bishop pair you know, the guy, like, we, we, we can't do that. Like, we need, to, we need to hit the gas, all right? So he hits the gas by playing the move bishop to c4. Now, by itself, that move kind of doesn't stun anybody because of dc4, rook d8. You don't need to be super high level to see this move. If you didn't see it, don't worry about it. Some, that's why you watch the videos. Uh, so bishop c4. Black plays queen e7. Now, queen e7 uh, is obviously a logical move because if queen e7... Then knight e7, and at least this pawn is defended. So Tal plays knight takes d5, which also makes sense, considering that black has removed the defender of the d5 pawn. And now we'll play queen a3. And in a perfect world, you know, we trade some pieces. Take, 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 here, and blah, 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 blah. And maybe Tolia, with the black pieces, thought, ah, we'll put a change figure, maybe we'll go to some No, literally, I, I, maybe that's what he thought. But, but Tal obviously had other plans, so he gave a check. Okay, I mean, and then he's gonna obviously take the queen back because you can't take either of these pieces because there's a queen right there. King e7. <clears throat> and then Misha said, Ya must have forgot, except no one forgot. Also, that quote didn't exist. Also, I don't think his English would have been that good that he could have said, Ya must have forgot. But I digress, and he played the move rook to e1. Yeah. Rook to e1. The threat? He wants to take with check. So, black has to save his queen. So, rook e6. King f8. Okay, very good. But now, you sack the rook. That's called a clearance sacrifice, because now your knight will get to e6 and fork these two pieces. Which is why an argument can be made that queen a5 was more accurate. Um, but if that would have happened, then there would have been bishop f4 and a reroute to d6. And that also looks absolutely terrifying, because I don't actually know how you guard your king. Uh, the engine here gives b5, bishop d6, king f7, and you walk in the face of danger and you laugh. But that, I don't know, that doesn't look very safe to me. Instead of that, uh, Lutikov decided that it was time to part ways with his own queen, but at least, potentially, be up in exchange. He's not up a queen anymore, but he has two rooks. But Tal swarmed him with his rook, knight, and bishop. And actually, in very Soviet style, in very Soviet style, he won this game in the funniest of ways. Check. And a very calm knight d3. Trapping the knight on a2. 
He could have taken a long time ago, but his knight was hanging all over the place. So he retreated. And uh, in true Soviet style, flashy, but also technical. And black just resigned. You would say, oh, why did he resign? Because knight and bishop and five pawns will beat rook and three pawns 10 times out of 10. 11 times out of 10, unless you're the one playing. Okay, next game. So now we enter the final three, which I told you in the intro, like these are Hall of Fame worthy moves. Um, you can decide which one is your favorite from these three or from the entire video. Uh, this game is Mysterious Germans because it's I couldn't find it anywhere. This is uh, actually a diagram from a John M's book called The Greatest Chess Moves Ever Played or something along those lines. Uh, by Meyer and Müller from 1994, although the game was played in Switzerland, allegedly. To be honest, this could have been like a group of dudes that just like analyzed the game after and were like, oh my god, here's a position. Anyway, so this is the position, allegedly, from the game, although there's no complete PGN anywhere on the internet. White is winning. Why is white winning? Because use your eyeballs. Look at this position. It's completely equal material. The king and the bishop here are hiding out in the nuclear bunker as like, you know, white is about to enter and infiltrate and just destroy the kingdom. But, how do you win? Now the reason I selected this game third out of the final three is, you're gonna see, uh, if you plug this into an engine, it's like plus 10. Like white could play king h1, king g1 for the rest of the game and still win with no problems. Uh, the best move here is bishop d5. Uh, it's bishop d5 because after the rook sacrifice, there's all sorts of moments you can infiltrate on e8. You're going to see what I'm talking about exactly. You can also end the game with knight h7, king h7, bishop g5, queen h4. You're winning like that as well. But try to find the move that would make this game a final three. That move, ladies and gentlemen, is the move queen to c7. That's cool. That's a cool move. The point of this move is that if you take with either of the back rank pieces, like queen, that's mate. Takes, takes, mate. This ta here, takes, takes, mate. Uh, if you take like this, then there's check or bishop d5. So the same idea, bishop d5. Uh, here, 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 bishop d5, and you just get crisscrossed applesauced with the bishops. And you need the knight to cover the f7 square. So black has to sacrifice both rooks and gets absolutely butchered. Now, the reason queen c7 is not the top move is because here there's this move knight to e5. Knight to e5 is a pretty funny move. Now, on the one hand, <clears throat> you can just take the queen, take b7, and then play this move f4, resetting up the threat of rook e8, at which point you will simply win a piece. But after knight e5, you can also play the absolutely savage, the absolutely gangster, queen takes b7. Just continue to ensure that your queen dies, then f4, then bishop d5, but bishop d5 would have been the more accurate move because after rook takes d5, this works perfectly now because knight e5 is met with queen takes h7, checkmate. So bishop d5 actually was better than, um, <clears throat> was actually better than playing queen c7 right away, but come on, come on. Queen c7. But anyway, that's why this game, there's like no PGN of it anywhere because it's total mystery. It's also like, eh, but it's a pretty dope move. All right, our final two. This one you've probably seen before, the gold coin game. Why is it called that? Because apparently after it happened, they showered the board with gold coins, which is kind of ridiculous. Like that seems kind of distracting. Um, also, where like who were these people in 1912 who could just throw their gold coins on the board. Like, how wealthy was this assortment of people? Anyway, uh, Frank Marshall, one of the best attacking players of that generation, versus Stefan Levitsky. Uh, Levitsky here plays rook takes d5, which is a good move. I mean, it, it looks like a pretty decent move, because ed5, there is this, and that leads to mate, rook f8, bishop e6. So, Marshall plays the move knight d4 here. <clears throat> and... White, uh, White's best move is to play queen e4, maintain this pin. But White goes for this, because seeing that the counterattack on the rook still exists, uh, White decides to play queen h5. And I guess was thinking that if g6 would be played, then queen e5 would attack this and this and continue this pressure. However, White really underestimated just the simple slide over. Because now the rooks are teaming up, this rook actually very much is under attack, rook e5. And... Frank Marshall here uncorks 
just the most disgusting form of savagery I think I've ever seen on a chessboard. Like, to me, this is probably number one in terms of uh, greatest moves ever. I decided to put it as number two in this video, in reverse, so the ninth out of ten. The move is rook to h6. That's not the move. Uh, here's the idea. Queen g5. And you would think, rook takes h3. All right, well, that's not so complicated because if this, then this. Yes, 100% correct. But white must have thought he was setting a trap with the move rook c5. Uh... Rook c5 is, uh, is interesting. So, for example, if something like queen b2, maybe rook c7, I, I, I don't know. I, I wasn't there at the time of this game. Uh, Levitsky decided that he was going to play one more move, um, which is going to attack the queen. And here, Frank Marshall thought for a little bit and played queen to g3. And that move is disgusting and the idea is that if you play hg you open up this and you get mated if you open up uh this then check here and you get mated or uh or 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 i bm you i check you one more time if you take with the queen then i mate you and then i would repeat just for bad manners uh and then i would mate you or you take like this and then knight e2 king h1 knight g3 and the best move here is this, <clears throat> at which point you would promptly lose material, and that would be the end of it. Um, but you'd actually have to be a little bit precise, like you'd need to win a game up at night, which not everybody can do. Frank Marshall can do it. And unlike any uh, games in this video, after Queen G3, Levitsky said, I'm, I'm done. Uh, we're done here. I'm like, no. No, 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 no. And then they showered it with gold coins, and everybody lived happily ever after. Let's go to our final game. Ladies and gentlemen, allow me to introduce you to the final game of this video. Arguably the greatest, the coolest chess move ever played. We are in Linares, España, uh, in 1998. 1998? Yeah, there we go. That's pretty good. Our protagonist, Alexei Shirov versus Veselin Topalov. Two of the strongest players of that time. Shirov was a beast. He was like number two in the world. Got slighted. Wasn't able to play for a world championship match. Uh, real story. Go check it out. Uh, and uh, he's up two pawns, but white has the opposite colored bishop situation. So there are moments where you can draw endgames like this depending on where the pawns are and depending how you create a blockade. But Shirov decided to play queen d5. Now he could have... Could he have played king h7 and kept the bishops on? Maybe. But this is actually even harder to win because of all the problems of your king. Like, you know, you can lose, too, by accident to get checkmated. So he decided to trade. Okay, so, well, now it's not too complicated. You have to move your A-pawn. But how do you win this? Levy, that's so easy. You just move your... They just become queens. Yeah, what, the bishop... In the words of Daniel Cormier, you think I'm just going to stand there and let you queen pawns, John? That's not exactly what he said. You think I'm just going to stand there and let you kill me, John? Like, uh, no... You're obviously not going to do that, but you would like your pawns to actually be together so you could push them on the dark squares and block out the bishop. King's going to have to come over there at some point, but so is this king. And white is going to put these pawns on dark squares so you can't ever win them with your bishop. So Shirov makes a couple of improving moves. And king g1. Now, g3 is coming. Like, maybe here even g3, but here's the thing. If black successfully gets the king more active faster, like here, 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 black wins. Uh, even if this pawn gets taken because you just block the bishop out. Or you even push, and it doesn't even matter if the bishop comes in because this king is just boxed out, right? So you see what I'm saying? Both pawns are active, but black's king dominates white's king. If that wasn't the situation, then this would be very drawable. The pawns wouldn't be able to come forward. Uh, I can show you what I mean by that. Uh, let's say a2, uh, king e1, king f5, king d2, like something like this. This is actually already significantly harder to win. It's... It's probably still winning, but it's significantly harder to win. Um, but it's probably still winning. So, probably. I, but that's not what happened. That's not the point. So, that's what black wants, right? So, we have king g1. In this position, Alexei was looking at a way to move his bishop and get his king to e4, but he couldn't do it. Because if he plays something like bishop c2, king f2, king e3 comes very quickly, right? So, king f2 and king e3. Um, which is why here, Alexei Shirov played 
this move. Just giving up the bishop completely. With tempo. The point is that if you ignore it, you just, the hell are you doing over here, you psycho? Well, then you're going to lose this. And three pawns down, you can rest assured you will lose the game. If you play g3 to then play this move, well, then I go here. We already see the problem. So then what the hell happens if you take this bishop? How are you just going to, how are you going to win this? King f5? King f2? King e4? That's it. It doesn't matter about the bishop. And the worst part for white is these pawns are doubled. So you can't even push them. Because if this pawn was here, you would just play h5. So now, bishop takes f6, you shut the door, bishop goes back to e7, you bring your king. And then the bishop tries to tickle this pawn, king c4, it could, this could also happen. Then king c2, d3, and, and the pawn promotes. The bishop cannot stop both pawns. Now, if the pawns were on the same diagonal, oh yeah, yeah, the bishop can stop them. But because they're so far apart, Shirov just brought his king so actively, blocking this king out and pushing this pawn. And here, Topalov resigned because you can win by pushing either pawn. You sag this one, and this is so brutal. There's no way to reroute fast enough to cover the corner. And so, uh, resignation occurred, like, somewhere. Like, king d3, I think. King d3, or right here. King b3, and Topalov resigned. I hope you enjoyed this list of games. If you made it this far in the video, I want you to know, as always, you are very much appreciated. And if you want me to cover any sort of content similar to this or very different in the future, you know what to do. Let me know in the comments. Peace out. Get out of here.